All right, can you see me now? No, just a silhouette. Yeah, we can see you. All righty. So I'm going to give you the benefit of the trees as landscape. How about that? An outdoors BLU meeting. Okay, so. Let's see, I need to uh, load the slides the right way since we have no projector. Will they work? They do. So. Right. Let's see. Now as moderator, do I, do I have to do anything to enable you to share the slides? No, nope. it just, uh, unless you set some uh, uh, more restrictive settings than usual that should not be required. And, um, uh, but you will have to start the recording if you haven't already. Yeah, I've already done that. Okay. Now, right now, I would set the gallery view. Do I have to set the speaker view first before I do the slides? Sure. Okay, so now I'm speak, uh, the speaker view now. Okay, so share slides. The screen, share, 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 full screen. Okay, let's see. I am not getting a cursor. Oh, I'm seeing your cursor. Oh, huh, that's funny. I am not. Oh, I know why. Uh, because I have probably a virtual screen somewhere and it's off on it. Hmm. Interesting. Why can't I see the cursor? Can you see the overlay? Yeah, you can see the overlay. Interesting. That I've never seen before. Hmm. Interesting. So it's due to the fact that I was full screen. It would seem. And now what happened? It exited. Okay, well, it worked. The, the overlay is gone. All right, we're ready. I can start anytime you want. Okay, I'm going to get the battery back up for the phone that I'm using as a microphone so we don't... We don't suddenly drop off later. There we go. I think I ran out of things to worry about. So, in theory, in theory, we're good. Let's try it. Oh, yeah, well. Anytime you want to start. So, you have the, <laughs> the practice slide here, not relevant. So, Okay, so ready, let's. Okay, doc, so um, this talk is, is designed to last an hour. We'll see if we can more or less make that time. The idea here is to give you a preview of my talk for um, the uh, Open Source Summit, which was supposed to be in Austin. Uh, and now is going to be a virtual event. I don't, uh, I don't know if anybody is going there in person or not. I think uh, they were trying to do both virtual and in person, and now it's going to be fully virtual, if I understood correctly. But these things change by the day. So let's get started and see where this goes. So um, I think. 
Um, most of you know me already, but the short version about me is that um, I had the privilege of spending my entire career in free and open source software. I am currently the product management director for Cepheid Red Hat. Previously, I was the Ubuntu server product manager at Canonical. If you use 14.04, that is my favorite child, at least so far. <laughs> um, and if you go back the decade, I was a systems management uh, czar at SUSE. Of course, none of these awesome organizations suffer from any of the issues that we're about to discuss. Oh, a shameless plug. I have a book on AWS system administration um, uh, by O'Reilly, and that's why you see the clouds there in my author portrait. And uh, you kind of see a list of things that I've worked on, um, various products from the companies that I mentioned, all the way to Ximian Red Carpet. And um, I was the maintainer of MAN for about a decade. So um, the MAN pager, um, MAN, MAN. So um, I usually speak about hardware hacking. Obligatory disclaimer is that we will most likely break some hardware uh, but that is not um, going to happen this time. <laughs> In this case, the hardware is your org and people may be involved. Caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. Proceed with caution and all that. Jokes aside, don't break people. The spirit of a management talk is to take what you like and leave the rest. I don't expect everything we will discuss today to make sense for your org. Woe for you if it does, uh, it would be a scary place to work at. You probably need 10 companies to manifest all the dysfunction we're about to discuss. So see what makes sense for you. Hopefully you can walk away with some useful um, takeaways. So our subject today is decision-making in the corporate organization. Decision-making in the modern corporation is riddled with paradox. The outwardly declared objective of the organization, which is making something, has to contend with the all too human realities ranging from the Peter principle to having too many cooks in the kitchen, to the individual's perfectionism, indecision, or even straight up cowardice. Decisions that are the lifeblood of your project can be deferred, avoided, eroded, or derailed in perfectly legitimate or even well-meaning ways. And this can spell death for what you're tasked to build, as success depends on implementation as much and possibly more as it does on your idea being actually good. So, you cannot execute if decisions are not prompt, mostly correct, and accepted by the team. That's why we're here. Okay, so decisions. I don't know about you, but I don't feel a sense of relief when the organization sends down decisions. And I'm a manager. Should we be really asking for decisions? Decisions are necessary because of how wonderfully unconstrained software is. Unlike some key, uh, until some key decisions are made, you could be building voting via blockchain or a self-driving car with the same team. Well, almost. Not really, but almost. Unless you're building a Katori special, and some of you will remember this cartoon, and I think it was from the 70s. A team making a car knows it will have four wheels, and it will be roughly a certain number of feet long, well, meters if you're in Canada. Apparently, someone built a Formula One racer with six wheels in the 70s, which was the inspiration for this cartoon. I think it was Tyrrell. But even if you buy the apex of automotive innovation today at Tesla, Elon Musk will still ship you four wheels. Manufacturers have lots of other problems to keep them busy, mind you, like union strikes, supply chains, inventories, shipping delays, Flooded mines, trade wars, even train derailments. This is a train derailment in Montana a few years back. 3737 fuselages went straight into the Clark Fort River in transit between Kansas and Washington State for final assembly. And you thought our problems were big. 
but the rigidity brings constraints that manufacturers team can build upon. They do not need to wait for you or your boss or your boss's boss to decide how many wheels do you want to go to market with. As Morpheus told us, the matrix allows us to make anything real as long as it is codified by electric signals. There are no constraints, well, except perhaps time and budget. As Jeff Bezos has famously pointed out, constraints drive innovation. One of the only ways to get out of a tight box is to invent your way out. Constraints are therefore wonderful. They clarify, cut through, and get to the essence of your problem domain. So let's free our minds about decisions. You're not that important. You can get things wrong and things will still be okay. As long as you do not stall the organization and your team is set up to recover quickly, a single contributor can stall a few colleagues by not taking a decision. I can block about 160 people by overthinking and stalling. My boss, more than 300. His boss in turn can block maybe 500 if he picks the right thing. And his boss could conceivably block all 15,000 one of us. That's no good. That is more important than getting things right. So here is a model to make the technically minded among you comfortable. Early in my career, I worked in the same office as Miguel de Casa for some years, so not on the same team. One thing that struck me about Miguel was the speed with which he would take technical decisions, often on the spot, in a couple of minutes. And he would defend that speed, allowing dissent, but not what he called stopping force, which would cause delays. Now, I'm sure Miguel would argue he has five nines in his decision success rate, but to me, his speed was striking, not his accuracy. That got, thinking, that got me thinking about the odds of his decision process. I was not in that team, but my impression was that he was right a lot, so perhaps not always. That got me thinking probabilistically, and I decided that for certain types of decisions, you could be right 70% of the time, and as long as you were fast, you would be a good manager. 90% would make you great, while well, 50% would make you a coin toss manager. That is one that you could be replaced by flipping a coin with the organization better off in the trade. Bezos again has a heuristic to offer here, having recently said that most decisions should probably be made with somewhere around 70% of the information you wish you had. Meaning waiting to have the full picture will make you late. Now, if you don't think you should be wrong one time, uh, no, I don't think I, that you should be wrong one time out of four. But the thought is liberating. At 75%, you could be wrong once every four decisions and still be a better manager than one making you wait a week for decisions that are 80% accurate. At 90%, you're off one out of 10. Allow yourself to be corrected by others. It's okay, really. I don't think I'm wrong every 10th time I make a choice, but even if I were, my concern would be first to discover if my team are getting decisions out of me fast enough, not if I need to move to 95% success rate. Besides, engineers will keep you honest. If your success rate is too low, you will know. <laughs> but if you're too slow, they may just let you be. So you need to police speed yourself and let them wake you up if you're getting sloppy. Still with me? One more detail is needed here. There are different classes of decision. Strategic decisions for one, choosing architecturally between Kubernetes, Swarm and Mesos uh, four years ago would qualify. If your strategist picked the wrong container orchestrator, now you're busy re-implementing and migrating your customers, inventing your own cloud infrastructure where everyone else flocks to um, 
um, I'm sorry, reinventing your own cloud infrastructure while everyone else is flocking to OpenStack a few years before is another example. These are hefty decisions and make all the difference between building a product for three years or gaining experience for three years that you can now use to rebuild your product with the winning technology a second time around. The opportunity cost is huge. It could sink a company. Some decisions are worth pondering for weeks, even months, if you really need to talk to a large number of folks. Now, I don't know about you, but momentous decisions of that magnitude are one or maybe two a year for me. The rest are things like monitor this cluster with CollectD or Prometheus, or install with Puppet or Ansible. It is not as dramatic a cost to change implementation tooling as it is to replace an architecture when the underlying factors or technology fashion changes. And these in turn are huge decisions compared to what you are deciding every week. So you have almost no excuse for not being, being blistering fast on questions that are almost tantamount to what parking spot should we use today in planning terms. You need to move it and let your team catch you if you fall on a fast one. While you don't let them down on the strategic, well-thought items, they will rescue you if you uh, slip on the day-to-day. -day. Think through the right stuff and move fast on the rest. And everything is good. Well, it is if you have a well-oiled team. Now that we have hopefully freed your mind to take decisions, let's look at what happens adding group dynamics and what anti-patterns emerge. The first and most destructive anti-pattern of corporate decision is not taking them. Perhaps the most damaging of all is postponing strategic decisions. So let's start there. This is somewhat recent uh, from Seth Godin's blog. The wrong bus. Your first mistake was getting on the A53 bus, the one that goes cross town instead of to where you were going. Mistakes like this happen all the time. The big mistake though, the one that will cost you, is staying on that bus. I know it wasn't easy to get on the bus. I know you got a seat. I know it's getting dark outside, but you are on the wrong bus and staying on the wrong bus won't make it the right bus. If you really want to get to where you set out to go, you're going to have to get off the wrong bus. So it doesn't matter why you got on the bus. It doesn't matter how much the ticket was. The only way you can fix this is by getting off the bus. I can tell you there is no solution I know of for the wrong bus problem. If you are a VP or a general manager or the boss uh, or their boss, the CEO, you can try. And depending on uh, you and the organization, you may be able to make a strategic change. But if you are lower in the organization like the rest of us here, we can only contribute to an org that wants strategic input, not force an organization to think strategically. You have to get off the bus if the strategy matters to you because you are never touching that steering. This bus always travels along the same path. But there are also good news. You can get people to steer for tactical reasons. We discussed having no constraints as a problem at a tactical level. You can force decisions from the leadership on budgets and schedules using the cone of uncertainty model. This concept was made famous by Steve McConnell, the author of Code Complete. You can get this poster from his company, Constructs, which delivers excellent training, by the way. The idea of the cone is to track the remaining variability of the project. This is the right way to, convene to, see, to convey to senior executives that we need to make up our minds as to what we are actually building. How many wheels does the car have, as it were? because we need to know what it is outside of the project as much or more than what's in it, especially at the start. 
The core decisions about business model, target market, feature MVP are gating the detailed planning and schedule. See how the curve changes and becomes linear. And you can hide very professionally behind this chart until they give you what you need. It forces a decision, but does so politely, implying no decision equals no schedule but without you ripping your hair out in front of them or doing anything dramatic. Let me share a personal battle story. Eons ago, so probably okay to tell, but let's put it this way. I was working for a Linux distribution and we unplugged the partner and let's just say their name starts with I and ends with BM. Now, unplugging the partner would be bad enough. But what happened was way worse. We unplugged all of their customers. Here's what happened, of course. I'm, of course, I'm on holiday. I think in Florida. Uh, my phone is programmed to make a sound for a predefined set of emergency red alert email subject lines. And it goes off repeatedly. I read the messages and my jaw drops. After I explained to my wife that I'm no longer on holiday for the rest of the day, I did three things. First, I sent an email to my boss and to his boss, the VP of product and to his boss's boss, the general manager of everything. I put lots of detail in because I'm a detail oriented kind of person, but the message was, I'm at DEF CON 1, you do not need to be. Then I tracked down the four people I needed to solve this mess my right-hand manager in Prague. Fortunately, Europe was still uh, on and awake. The lead engineer in Utah and his manager also in the US. I would like to tell you that we met in 15 minutes, but we did not have iPhones and Google Calendar. It was the age of Blackberries and Groupwise. So it took a little bit longer to organize, but maybe an hour later, we were all on the phone. These are people who know me well. We worked together for years and they are visibly nervous, even shaken. We are bouncing update requests for a sizable chunk of the user base of a partner delivering 25% of our revenue. This is scary. The first thing I say to them is, I assume full responsibility for this incident. Do not worry about explanations. Let's just fix it. It was like lifting a huge weight off their shoulders. You could almost hear them breathing easier. With that out of their heads, they all focused on solving the problem. Nobody is getting blamed for the past. Now the job is to make sure we're not all blamed for the future, meaning the next few hours. What was previously not thought possible was implemented in follow the sun mode and the issue was resolved in 24 hours. By 36 hours, support was confirming resolution with the few customers who had realized that could not access their updates. I get a couple of jokes from the GM and everything is back to normal. What happened here and why did I do this? So the first thing is fear. These are people I worked with for a long time. They can handle some stress, but the situation called for more than handling. It called for resolving a problem we previously thought we could not solve and to do so really fast. I needed amazing performance on instant schedule. I did not want them distracted. So removing fear allowed them to laser focus on the problem. This is the easy one, but there is more going on here. So any ideas? What, what is the second reason why I acted this way? Any takers? Okay, so they are my team. I'm going to protect them anyway. So I might as well tell them now that I'm going to, so they can relax. We accomplished under extreme time pressure and stress something that months before we thought we could not do. Focus helped us do that because folks were on the problem. The politics of the rest of the organization was off the table. And I announced that this buck stops with me. 
when I did that, I enabled people to focus exclusively on what needs doing next, not on CYA for what has already happened. Now, one word of caution. Removing worry for the group can be a powerful technique, but danger, Will Robinson. Your team will appreciate your behavior, but there is a problem. Multiple problems, actually, but let's focus on one. As your sphere of influence in the organization grows, someone is bound not to like you. So, it's nothing specific. Maybe you, uh, it's you, but even if you are Mother Teresa, even if you are the nicest person, one of 500 colleagues will not like you. Who knows why? The meme here is funny, but it is not about people being evil. It's just the law of large numbers. If you have enough influence that you have, um, if you have enough influence, Uh, that you have to contend with these son of a snake people dash statistical phenomena, um, you cannot leave yourself that open. They may even sabotage you to make your recovery effort fail in the worst case, if you're in a really political organization. While in the best case, they will just advertise your original failure to the four winds. As a community manager put it to me, Assuming responsibility like I chose to do in my story does not scale. At the very least, you need to make sure you taking the heat does not invite trolls to the party and make the problem actually worse. So that's, there are other concerns, but at the very least, just from the execution point of view, you need to make sure that, that you're not creating a worse problem. Now, fear is an extreme case. But there is risk aversion everywhere at work, and that's another anti-pattern. It may be cultural in a permission-driven society, maybe some form of politely deferring to you out of respect. It does not have to be full on fear, but the mechanism is the same. If people are not sharing their thinking enough, they may not have been asked or trained to speak up, but more likely they simply do not realize they're in a safe space to share their ideas. Remove risk. Tell them it's your decision and hint, hint, responsibility. But you want to hear everyone's ideas before taking it. You may think of risk aversion as, managing the, as the managing down version of the cone of uncertainty, which is the managing up approach to make people speak up. Now, the opposite scenario is too many cooks in the kitchen. Zero fear. Anyone chimes in on everything. Open discussion is fine, but pointless chatter is not. At some point, you're not adding anything, and the cost of communication is way far from small, as Brooks Law teaches us. You want to cut back a little, but you don't want to shut down communication completely, which would be the outcome if you outright tell people not to say anything stupid ever. So tuning the balance of risk aversion is a powerful mechanism for increasing or reducing communication. I know this developer that five or six years ago during a planning sprint in front of Mark Shuttleworth went and chipped in a somewhat crazy idea just to be cute. At least he thought it was crazy and funny. That was his point. Mark pretended not to understand this was a joke, made it a core part of his keynote plan for the next OpenStack summit to be delivered in three months. That engineer stopped joking in the wrong meetings, I can assure you. He had to implement and present a demo alongside the head of the company. And he did a darn good job of it too, but I think he also learned something else there. Uh, here is why too much communication is too much. This is from a book from Matt Nicholson, When Computing Got Personal. It's like getting 400,000 people to agree what they want to have for lunch. I mean, it's just not going to happen. It's going to be the lowest common denominator. It's going to be hot dogs and beans. So what are you going to do? IBM had created this process and it absolutely made sure that quality would be preserved throughout the process. 
that you actually were doing what you set out to do and what you thought the customer wanted. At one point, somebody looked at the process to see what it's doing and what's the overhead built into it and found that it would take at least nine months to ship an empty box. Tidener 1996. What I really love about this quote is that someone went out, studied it and put a number on the overhead. I absolutely love the approach, it's so IBM. Nine months to ship an empty box. IBM is not the only company tripping on its own red tape. And here the focus is on communication overhead. Get 400,000 people to agree. That appears to be too much communication. IBM also gave us Brooks Law on the cost of communication, showing that they were studying this problem attentively. Adding people to a late project makes it later. Ultimately, only you can decide how much is right for your product or for your engineering team or your audience. But this is your starting point. There is too much and there is too little. What about the next anti-pattern? What if the problem is that they cannot be bothered to care? You would think they would just say yes and send you on your way. But instead of the justifiable fear we faced earlier, here we have cowardice or laziness even. What happens if someone stamps your project with a yes? They feel somewhat responsible. They aren't really. The people who think this way are 599th in line for the blame. But these are process focused people and you need something from them, usually bringing nothing in exchange. The classic example of this is needing something from the IT department. Did you get a PayPal bowl approving your request? Oh, you missed the 2018 planning deadline back in 2016. See you next year. Good luck moving at internet, I mean DMV speed with these functions. Those, there, for these, there are three things that you can do. The first is respect. Not as, as in polite and proper, which you should be anyway. Here is a story. One of the Linux Foundation board members and me are selling this product concept to a C-level investment board within the company. We addressed general managers, the chief marketing officer, and a few others. And next is the head of support. This was a very mysterious stakeholder to us because her role did not really have anything to do with creating a product. None of the other six products created that year required support approval at this level. This was done by her staff two levels down. Here we had her ear only because of the new C-level uh, investment board process. So we are perplexed. We do not know her. I do not know the motions that this corporate role expects from us. Um, and we could just show up and give her the facts we prepared for the previous executive, but that made no sense to me. So I call my mentor, the head of product. I explain my predicament. I need this approval. I'm not sure what she will care about. I don't know her. I don't know what KPIs a four removed executive on the support line tracks. I'm basically blind. I don't want to have a meeting to get slapped around and then do it right the second time or the third time. My mentor gives me a number of items he thinks she will care about. Will we create more incidents than the existing version? Will we need to hire more people and support? Stuff like that. So I schedule a meeting to go over material created for this person specifically. I make it relevant to her concerns. I made the meeting about what she needs from me, not about the approval I need from her. Although that's obviously why I'm there. She asked me something I did not expect. Will hardware returns be going through her team? And what about warranties? Great question. I worked that out all last month. Avnet takes all the Dell hardware and player loads it with our software, handles shipping and returns. We never touch any hardware. We do not have any inventory in the book, on the books. We just pay a bill once a quarter. She was impressed, I think. But in any event, she gives us her nod and we go on to seek the next executive approval. 
this is very much of a community manager type of skill. Respect in being polite and considerate of others should be natural to everyone. Respect for other people's time, as in don't show me 40 slides you made for someone else, is rarer. But a community manager can understand what someone, he or she does, not necessarily agree with is thinking and start from there. That is what this approach is. At the opposite end of the spectrum is making it ridiculous not to agree with you. Mind you, you are not ridiculing a person that would not be nice. No, you're doing something completely different. You are making it harder to embrace a set of ideas with sand sandbagging power contrary to your proposal. You make it ridiculous for folks to take that position before they declare themselves. Here is a good example. If the slide loads, there we go. This is from an old notebook of mine. I got this slide from Nat Friedman when he was working on getting early funding for SUSE Studio. He had this slide that collected all objections you always hear about innovation, from the objections that the company historians like me would have knowing all past failures. I can pull up an example at will. To the hilarious juxtaposition of it has been done before and it has never been done before, which you could very well face. Very nice. Now let's say you are in an operational role and you have some approval power, maybe accounting or even the CFO. Do you want to be labeled an innovator or someone who does not understand innovation? This slide is disarming to anyone who does not care and wants to sandbag you with generic objections. It defangs the defenders of the status quo and works wonderfully in large meetings where you can neutralize multiple naysayers in one shot. Now, the third option is opening a can of whoop ass. Discouraged on so many levels, and we will see why later. So hold your horses. The key here is that people who are sandbagging you essentially do not care and have nothing at stake. Losing your temper in some variant changes the equation. You are on the offensive and now they need to spend effort to defend. In negotiation terms, it changes their BATNA. That is the, this is the best alternative to a negotiated agreement negotiators use as their bottom line. If the negotiation is going nowhere, you walk away and get the BATNA, meaning it is what does not require agreement for you to, from the other party for you to achieve. In the case where your interlocutor does not care, you are asking them to invest effort while they could just do nothing. Their BATNA is sadly better than what you are offering. The result is that they are sincerely uninterested. If you fail, give up on your project or simply walk away, they have less work to do. The can of whoop ass radically changes this math. Now they need to put in work to defend it from your attack. It is suddenly better to just agree to your boring to them, an interesting request and move on. And more on this later. Um, there is a better approach than going fully on the warpath. There is a better approach to achieving this than a can of whoop ass. The Oppenheimer and, Oppenheimer and Feynman approach, let's call it this way. Richard Feynman was a Nobel Prize winning, uh, winner in physics, of course, and among his many achievements, one of the youngest PhDs on staff at Los Alamos during the Manhattan Project. One day, Project Chief Robert Oppenheimer sends him to Oak Ridge in Tennessee, where fissile uranium is being separated from the common isotope for safety inspection. Um, the material is being produced by people who have not been briefed by the military on nuclear chain reaction risks, and Oppenheimer fears that there will be an, in, uh, there will be an accident with people in the blind about the risk of an explosion. Feynman objects. Dr. Oppenheimer, you are telling me that the military bigwigs at Oak Ridge are going to listen to me, little Richard? Yes, they will, says Oppenheimer. And he explained he is to use the following words. Los Alamos will not assume responsibility for the safe, safety 
of the Oak Ridge plant if these concerns are not addressed. Feynman flies over, has other adventures along the way, including other passengers, passengers wondering how this youngster got a seat on the plane during wartime. And sure enough, the plant managers do what he says. And for the record, he does indeed find problems and resolves them before there is a problem, there is a catastrophic incident. What is going on here is assumed on ownership. The person sandbagging your project presumes it will stay your responsibility even as they wash their hands of doing their part. They are wrong and you can make it very clear without ruffling your feathers one bit. The modern version of Feynman's line is, my team cannot deliver a corporate level OKR without your support. The corporate objective tracked by the board will be missed and it will be on you. Make drop, have a nice day. You will not carry the ownership for them if they do not deliver their part, whereas you will if they do. Blame versus potential credit. On the receiving end of this strategy, you may honestly not have the resources to deliver all your known and unknown commitments, in which case you surface the conflict and let the higher ups decide what they want more. I can do this or I can do that. That's perfectly legitimate. But sandbagging and saying, I'm not gonna commit until next year, that's not okay. So uh, don't do it and don't let others do it. Now let's go back to the can of Wu Pass, since that is entertaining. Going zero dark 30 on someone, if you have not seen the movie, it is really worth watching. In this scene, Maya, a CIA analyst who has been trying to capture the terrorist bin Laden for 10 years, tells a higher up that if she does not get the resources she needs for the mission from this guy, we are seeing from the back, he will be the first chief of station summoned in front of Congress for subverting the effort to capture or kill Osama bin Laden. And that seems pervasive enough. But let, first let's look at her face. That is reason number zero not to do it. It is hard on you. It is your blood pressure shooting up, not the other person's. It is also hard on your reputation. You are expected to keep your cool. If you really must do it, you want to make sure your direct boss, your VP and your GM have your back and you have weapons release authority. If they do not care enough about the problem to back you, neither should you. You can be the bad cop if they need you to, but you should not be the organization's lone gunman. Finally, you should always be hard on the problem, not the people. Do not attack the person, attack the problem and demand others do their part to solve it. There is perhaps a situation where you feel you can legitimate take the can of Wu Pass path. And that is dealing with someone who puts their selfish interest above the team or the companies. You have to think this is, uh, you have to think this through, however. <coughs> a consummate player will not be taken by a simple assault. More important for you is to wonder if you are working for the right company, if so many things are upsetting you. If I'm upset twice the same year, I drop whatever I'm doing and I sit half an hour in peace with a nice view of outside in an empty conference room, considering why I should not call my headhunter. It is a good routine to check the limits of your own tolerance. If it doesn't make sense, maybe it does not make sense. You may not, uh, you may not go medieval on a toxic element, but there is something else you need to realize. Folks who do not let you discuss important decisions by throwing a lot of noise and chaff in the way to delay need, uh, to delay need to be removed from the critical path. They will not go away on their own. You or someone above you will need to do something about them, preferably sooner rather than later. Corporate sabotage is such an ex effective strategy, the Office of Strategic Services, which was the CIA's predecessor 
circulated a manual on bureaucratic sabotage in the 40s to sympathetic industry staff in the Third Reich. This is a very interesting read. People operating with the techniques described in this book should be put on notice. And if you care about, it should be put on notice if you care about the health of your organization. Um, somebody uh, needs to mute. I'm not sure, but Hi, your sorry. phone is your phone is ringing. Okay, looks like that was solved. All right, next time type pattern. This is a self-sustaining team generated variant of the last, and it comes in multiple org chart versions. The traditional one is technologists debating a point forever. This is easy to unlock. If your team respects users as those we are trying to serve, you can bring in customer data to point the ship in a general direction and unlock the discussion. Then let it proceed naturally among the experts. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm stuck on the previous slide. So the self-sustaining team generated variant of the Internal saboteur is analysis paralysis, where the group is doing this um, to itself. To point it in the right direction with data and let the technologies continue if it is a technology problem indeed. Then there is variant one. I will take revenge of the German bureaucrat for $50, Alex. This is one of my favorites. The name is just crazy. The moniker comes from, comes from this German chief of police in one of Jack Reacher's novels. When he gets upset with his boss, uh, the station chief's, chief stops taking any decision and sends every single question, no matter how small, to his boss. Distributed denial of service attack by bureaucratic means. Germans incidentally have some of the best words to describe out of control paperwork. Papierkrieg, the paper war, is a term old enough that Werner von Braun's boss already used it in the 1940s. So what do we do about um, the revenge of the German bureaucrat anti-pattern? Well, here you need to be aware of what is going on first and refuse to take decisions that aren't yours. If necessary, point out the other team has the experts on the topic. Why are they asking you? They can clarify what help is that, and that they are seeking. Ultimately, in a worst case situation, you could just ignore the requests. But it is better to make really sure these are not well-intentioned requests for your help first as folks with insufficient agency may simply feel too deferential towards you. They want to send the decision to you. Maybe the boss wants to take the decision. Make clear to them you think they are the domain experts and they need to lead, while you will be happy to help as needed in your area of expertise only. They are in charge. Propose what is that they want to do. Let, let the path manifest itself. You will correct, you will ask questions if something appears out of place. Now, the second variant comes from the opposite angle. Instead of the team pushing tasks upstairs, it is the managers from upstairs putting their noses in decisions they should not be taking. As a manager, this is easier to diffuse. As you can point out, to the other managers that really the best decision here would be taken by those actually doing the work as they understand what's going on. As they understand it best is the nice way to put it. Throw in a micromanager for bonus points. Nobody wants to hear that they could be one. An individual contributor can have a harder time diffusing this. So just ask a sensible manager already in, in, in the jamboree to disband the group of interlopers for you if that's what's going on. Find someone sensible and say, hey, I need this committee to go away. I need to work. Now you have the tactics. The countermeasures, part two, rules for rebels, is the next step. You need uh, 
um, a strategic plan, and it will be only one slide. And yes, we're going to end on a cliffhanger. You have the fun part with all the stories. The follow-up is how I look at this every day and then yet remain mostly sane. We will write this up as an article on opensource.com and on my blog uh, when I get to, to write this up. Meanwhile, that is it for today. Back to your personal circus, hopefully with some new skills in your tool chest for dealing with the individual patterns. So, any questions? I hope I've given you at least one or two useful thoughts. It took a lot of time to build this out. Um, I really enjoyed it, uh, Federico. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. Yeah, that was a good talk. Uh, sorry about that interruption earlier. I, oh, no, mute, no worries. I, I muted everyone except you uh, when the meeting started, but I guess someone joined in the middle of it and, uh, and unmuted themselves. As soon as I noticed that, I muted them. No I worries. Just, I just unmuted everyone now so we can do Q&A. Yep, yeah, but so now Federico, is, oh, Fed, Federico has two uh, logins anyway. Oh, yeah. All right. Federico, are you still going to do that presentation for the virtual um, open source summit? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the plan. I have to see how we are going to record that, uh, but um, I think um, the Linux Foundation is using the same system that Red Hat use, used for Red Hat Summit, so it should be relatively straightforward. There is a track that's um, management and community management uh, headed by Joe Bacon uh, that's going to be at the summit. So that's, um, that is the rare window where we actually get to speak of, uh, about management topics in a technical conference. So it, it happens once a year, maybe twice a year, if we can do it at the uh, Open Source Japan Summit. It's, uh, it's a rare opportunity to talk a little bit about how to manage things instead of technology. Uh, so, Frederico, um, this is Bill Bogstead. Um, I can see a lot of what you're saying is very applicable to um, tech development companies uh, that are doing cloud computing of that sort. Um, uh, but computer software is used in a lot of other areas with a lot more critical concerns. Yeah. Um, where uh, I'm wondering at what point would you say that your suggestions are no longer relevant? I think um, that would change as we move up the, so there are, there are multiple layers of this, right? This is meant to be the, the anti-patterns and um, when you point out that things are broken, people find it funny and they laugh, right? So it's, it's a good way to build a topic that gets attention because it, it's entertaining. But it's also the first layer. It's basically, these are the positive patterns, build trust, build uh, a safe environment for people to speak up. These are the anti-patterns. Here are how things go wrong. But then when you have these building blocks, you have addressed these, you have a working team, have trust between the players, then you have the, the higher up things, like you can still have a completely broken strategy. How do you, do you deal with that? So, um, and, and that's probably the highest point. There are, there are things in between. So from my point of view, the idea is that you would have different talks at different layers and the higher you, up you go, uh, the more things change. So if you're making, I don't know, flight control systems for airplanes or something for MGH maybe. Um, maybe it doesn't apply if it's research, but certainly if it's on the hospital side. Obviously, you have much different constraints, but uh, you have to remember that the corporate organization, if left to its own devices, goes only into two places. One is maximizing profit. That's the one that you typically read on the newspapers because it produces good copy for journalists saying, hey, scandal, look, they made all this money and then they did nothing or they made all this money and they robbed, robbed somebody blind. 
and it it also plays well with the the current streak of going to extremes on the left or on the right but there is another way corporate organizations go wrong which is uh they trap themselves in their own red tape this is well-meaning red tape it's meant to make sure that you never fail so ultimately you have one extreme that is profit maximizing and the other extreme which is quality maximizing and you can maybe morally argue about profit maximizing if you're not gordon gecko you're not gonna like that angle but but it's hard to argue that quality maximizing is a bad thing however it is because what? if left if left unchecked, you're basically saying so, uh, that you're going to do something forever and it's never going to ship. You're on the, yes, this thing will have perfect quality, but it's going to ship into NT40 when we're done doing everything. And that doesn't work either. I usually look at this pattern as um, airport security. You're going to try to stop the guy that uh, had explosive in their shoes. That only happened once, I think it was 2002, that someone tried to blow up a jetliner by, I don't know, they amputated their feet and filled their shoes with, with explosive or something crazy like that. They tried, they failed. But we now all take off our shoes in every airport in the United States. Why? We're trying to solve a problem that doesn't really exist and never really existed. But we spend time, we pay a cost for it, we pay a delay for it, and you keep adding more and more and more of these things if you have an organization that just follows its own devices. So you have to work against these patterns and ultimately somebody has to be responsible for creating balance. Uh, and that's that's a role of management. And it's since senior management won't do it, they're too removed from it. That's something that middle managers can contribute. And I don't think that changes depending on whether you're making medical software or or uh, a stupid iPhone application, and it doesn't need to be stupid, but I guess it could be. Um, the constraint still applies. You need to ship for users to have it. Um, so there is a gradation between velocity and, and quality, but you can never go full on quality, just like you probably shouldn't go full on velocity unless, unless you really don't care about your users and there is really nothing at stake for what you're doing. Does that make sense? Yeah, that was helpful, thanks. Mm -hmm. I think it may change more as you go up the, the chart because, because the strategic aspect starts uh, coming in. You cannot ignore it anymore. But when you're looking at tactical, it's, yeah, the balance is, is somewhat straight. Other questions? Hey, Federico, this is Shankar. Um, so I had one Hi, question Shankar. about about yeah about your uh, the example that you gave right where you <laughs> you were disturbed from your vacation because something went wrong <laughs> right uh, and i mean i kind of agree with your with what, what you said there right that uh, um uh, you know when you know um something hits the fan that's not the time to be discussing who's to blame and and right. you know, uh, uh, dwell on you know how it happened but focus on okay what what can we do to get this thing fixed and, and move forward, right? But after right. that is over, uh, you know, you've averted the crisis or you or you resolved it, whatever. Um, afterwards, you still want to understand why that happened. Uh, was it, you know, an individual error or whether it was something in your process that was broken that caused it? Like, how do you, how do you go do that postmortem without it, at that point, devolving into finger pointing? Into <laughs> witch hunting, yeah. Yeah, I think um, it's hard. I mean, postmortems are hard every time. Um, um, there are a number of ways to do it. I tend to have, I tend to send in my comments to the program manager. And if I show up at the postmortem, I listen only uh, or I speak only at the end. I, I try to be in the background so everybody else feels like they can they can speak and they don't need to defer to my opinion or or feel that they necessarily need to agree with me or or disagree with me in some case so that would be one uh, the other thing is um you try to keep it nice as much as possible um and if the people organizing the meeting are trying to do that usually 
people line up fairly well. I think it's ultimately it's a question of you have have you built a healthy organization? Um, in a healthy organization, people will not be jumping at each other, but there is also going to be some measure of accountability, right? Um, in my experience, it it very rarely happens that you're in the right spot. Um, either you have an organization where the accountability is pro forma and it's mostly bureaucratic and it's have you achieved your annual objectives kind of thing and or did you screw up really badly <laughs> and that's the extent of your accountability but it, it shouldn't be it should be have you made it possible to ship on time <laughs> have you increased the quality of the product have you made it better than last time and the problem is that it's hard to quantify these things and um I'm a big believer in OKRs, but I also think that OKRs have very big limits. Uh, Andrew Grove, who was probably the the saint patron patron of OKRs, thought that for every met metric you create, you should create a second metric that counterbalances the the unintended consequences of the first. And that's that's what you will always have when you try to to uh, mechanically enforce things. So. Usually, I'm somewhat skeptical of people that think that they can solve quality problems or, or organizational problems by process. The, if the organization is broken and people are defensive, they will play the process, but they will not fix the problem. And if the organization is broken because people are not being nice to each other or they are not uh, trusting each other or some of them are not even trustworthy, uh, process will never fix it. So um, ultimately, you need to build a team of people who want to work with each other every day and they feel they're doing something great. And by encouraging them to build something, you get this positive effect. Yeah, the HR effect, uh, the HR theory that you're going to give them objectives and that's going to make everything great, um, I think it, it's, it's pretty much visible everywhere that it doesn't work. The best place in the world in terms of managing objectives and OKRs is Google. And you don't hear the same jokes about Google that you heard about Microsoft and their, uh, their uh, end of year evaluation processes in the last decade, but you almost hear the same things. And they are literally the best place at doing this kind of thing. So from my point of view, this is the place where it's an art and it's about the personal relationships. It's not about I can create a mechanical process to do it. So for me, the postmortem is very personal. It's very much about, well, this person screwed up once, but that's okay. We identify the problem and we'll never do it again. Um, and there is this history about um, a submarine uh, mate in a, in a German submarine. Uh, actually, if you visited the Chicago Museum of Science, there is a German U-boat uh, in the garden there lifted out of the lake and it's an exhibit and you can walk through it. If, if you read the history of that submarine on its first cruise, one of the trainee German sailors screwed up and the submarine wound up almost vertical and they were really close to sinking because they, they did not react correctly at the right time in terms of opening valves. And uh, obviously after they figured out what happened, they had a postmortem and they figured out what happened. But um, uh, when the captain sent for the sailor that was responsible, uh, what he told the sailor was, okay, I, have you learned what happened? It's like, yes, I figured it out. Will you ever do this mistake again? <laughs> no. <laughs> and, and so he let him go with that, even though this was military, um, uh, military discipline in Nazi Germany. But that was... Uh, uh, a team building moment because the rest of the crew understood that the captain took care of his people uh, and accepted that this was even though it almost cost them all their lives it was a legitimate mistake for a sailor that had basically never been on a submarine cruise before and was being trained so you have to try it carefully and and it's an art it's not it's not uh, a science here you cannot do it as a program manager would by following a, a very long checklist. That's, that's my take anyway. There are other people may do it differently.
Uh, that makes sense, Frederico. Uh, thank you. Sure. So uh, any other questions left? Otherwise, I, I'll have a couple of comments in terms of what you can do to maintain your personal sanity. No questions. So uh, one thing is, as a middle manager, you can very easily obsess about what you cannot change. There are things that you cannot change, like the route of the bus that we were talking about at the beginning. You, you cannot spend your time obsessing about that. The strategy has been set by somebody else. You're here to execute the strategy. You get yourself promoted into the corner office, then you will change the strategy. But until then, that is not your problem. So especially as the organization is bigger than a small startup, it's very clear there are things that you cannot change. They may be wrong. They most certainly are wrong. Uh, unless they are something that, that compromises your ethics or breaks the law, where obviously you have an obligation to do something, uh, at the very least walk away. Um, the rest, you have to just let it be and let the people that are in charge of that part of the problem deal with it. Now, uh, another thing that you want to stay away from is too much planning. And that goes to sort of what I was using as my explanation to Shankar for my hands-off attitude to some of the post-mortems. Um, in large organizations, there is a bias towards too much planning. Now, I'm, I'm technically trained. I will always plan more <laughs> than, uh, let's say, somebody that comes from a business degree. But uh, the point is not how much I like planning. The point is that there is a thing uh, which makes too much planning. So you want to determine where that line is. In a, in a corporate organization, there is always going to be someone that can build a career by being the planning person. If you're in program management, great. Um, maybe some engineering managers can do that. For everybody else, it's about delivering what they are tasked to build. And so there has to be the right level of paperwork. Not too much, not too little. Remember what Mike Tyson said when, um, about planning. Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. The plan is valuable, but only so much so. And um, the, act, the act of planning is often more valuable than the plan itself. The fact that you went through all these conversations and you created the plan and you examined all the possibilities is what's valuable. Yes, you have version three of the plan, and then next week you will have version five of the plan. That doesn't matter. You will keep adjusting it. But the fact that you examined all the possibilities, the fact that you went through the planning is what, uh, what this whole exercise meant. And that is where you want to focus your program people as opposed to um, running a rules, Robert Rules of Order kind of organization where everything is minutely tracked. And then, um, one other thing uh, that you have to figure out is who is that is going to say no. Now, um, one observation um, that I made very early in my career is that because IT is a growth industry, at least as long as um, AMD and Intel keeps giving us Moore's law, we are growing so fast that uh, the success is in building things. It's not in optimizing them or destroying them. So in other words, uh, if you forgive me the abuse of the Indian Trinity, everybody wants to be Brahma and nobody wants to be Shiva. So everybody wants to be the creator, nobody wants to be the destroyer. And so you have all this craft sticking ar around from I don't know, 20 years ago, Compaq did things this way, so Red Hat needs to do things this way. Really? No, but nobody's being rewarded for going around and saying this process that was invented in 1995 could go away. That's not what will make your career at Red Hat. So it sticks around. 
And so it piles on and piles on and piles on until one company replaces another, which is typically the way we clean up shop in, uh, in our industry. So if you need to keep things lean enough that they move along, somebody needs to say no. And um, the engineers will not say no. They are going to chase after the new shiny object in technology. And the sales guys are not going to say no. All that they can do is figure out what the customer of the day wants and ask you to do it. And then next week, it's going to be a different one. And that's only if you're lucky. It could be tomorrow. So um, as a product manager, I feel very much that a key part of the job is for you to decide what's the 20% that's important that you need to get done and the 80% that's irrelevant. And somehow keep the team focused on that. Then, um, the, more practically, um, you want to invest in customs. Uh, you want to invest in outcomes, not in process. In other words, you want to figure out what is that you want to come at the end of all this, not how you get there. How you get there, you will change and you will do it so many times that you will improve it and improve it and improve it. But um, again, corporate processes tend to track process. You want to focus on outcomes. In this regard, you want to be much more like sales. You want to have some KPI that is actually, did you bring in money or not? Because a lot of architectural discussions can go on forever about theoretical benefits. Yeah, we can make it 3% faster. Does it matter to the customer that it's 3% faster? Not really. How was it on time? No, it was six months late. Well, then maybe that matters more. So outcomes over processes. And again, you have to check the organization because the organization will always go process over outcomes if left to its own. And then uh, one more thing, you can't solve everything yourself. And so you have to figure out what is the spirit of the other managers in the team or even the individual contributors that have energy or interest or passion for something that's going on. And you want to empower these key agents to do what you want the team to, um, to push the team in the direction that you want it to move towards. So there is a manager that joined my team two years ago and he is absolutely passionate about building processes. I uh, am not, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. And, but I was like, this guy really loves this thing. We're going to give him carte blanche to make it better. And he keeps going at it. And every release, he finds a way to improve it. So that's great. I don't need to retain control of that just to say that I'm in charge of it. I'm perfectly happy to have Scott run it. But because he is in charge of it, he feels that it's his thing. He protects it, defends it, makes it better. And all that I have to do is saying, I found the right person. I gave him the keys to that area and I defended it when somebody else tried to come in and say, no, 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 Scott cannot take these decisions. We have to have a committee oversee him. No, we don't. Scott is in charge unless, unless something else happens. Um, so you, you empower these key agents so that you can multiply yourself. You cannot do everything yourself. So you want, you want somebody to take charge of this problem? Is there somebody who cares? You want the team to be nice. Make the, the people that are nice to each other powerful and protect them from the people that are mean. When somebody is mean, stop them. Tell them, hey, this is not okay, or this is not the thing that you are here to do. Um, basically, amplify the right part of the process. This is, I guess, uh, usually we call this leading by example when it's about yourself, right? But in this case, we're talking about a group. Uh, and what you're doing is that you are amplifying the parts of the team that are producing good things for the rest of the team. And so they act as multipliers for what you want to accomplish, and they are doing it for you. You are not doing it. So it's, it's making you saner, and it's, it's helping the team achieve the same thing. And then last but not least, um, there is this pattern um, where uh, people cannot focus, which is always a problem in our type of organization. 
And they cannot focus in the sense that there is always something else. You make a strategic plan, maybe you made it, maybe more likely the organization made it. Right now, my organization has a strategic plan that says that 80% of investment goes to building storage for one of the three markets we serve, and 20% of investment goes to maintaining the storage for the other two markets we serve. That is our strategic imperative. That is sensible, at least it was sensible when it was when we did the analysis last year, and it still seems sensible. We'll see when we do the analysis again this year. But the organization doesn't think this way. The organization thinks there is somebody that wants to have a meeting right now because he says we don't have products to sell to Apple. And according to him, we absolutely must have a product to sell to Apple. Uh, Another guy wants to go up against NetApp selling file servers. Yeah, are these part of our strategic imperative? No, but they seem like things that they want to do. And so the, the only way you can defend the focus is by uh, following uh, Michael Porter's observation that a strategy is about you, what you choose not to do. And aside from the people at the top who created the strategy, right or wrong, who understand Michael Porter, all of them have MBAs, the, the people that are usually way smarter about other things in the trenches in engineering don't understand this. They want to build everything. And uh, the engineers are not the worst offenders. The sales guys are the worst offenders. The, wor the sales guys want a product for every single customer they ever cross paths with. Uh, the only way you can defend the strategy is by being the police of saying, well, this 20% is what we're doing. The rest may be great, but it's not what we're doing right now. And the reason why I mentioned Apple earlier is that the irony of saying I'm going to break the strategy to go after Apple is, is just enormous because Apple under Steve Jobs was one of the best managed companies in this regard. They would have a, an annual strategy meeting and they would have 10 proposals polished to the extreme by the executives, and then they would choose one, and that's what they would create as the new product. The other ones were agreed to be excellent. I mean, in one year, they had the iPad and the iPhone in the same crop of proposals. Those sound like blockbusters if you compare them to the proposals that most other companies have for new products. And yet, they chose one. They decided that the iPad had to wait. And that kind of, of um, strategic focus enabled them with $100 million of investment a year, which was less than what Sun Microsystems was investing in R&D at the time, and 10 or 20 times less than what Microsoft was investing, in, enabled them to grow into the largest company uh, in the world 10 years later, because they were focusing on the right thing. They were not going all over the place ch chasing shiny objects. Now, you're not the defender of strategy. You're just a middle manager. But you have to do your part in terms of focusing your team on what you committed to deliver versus what is extraneous. Experiments are okay. Discovery is okay. And I'm a big fan of having the engineers tell me, hey, there is this cool new thing over there, because that's the only way as a product manager I can avoid innovator's dilemma. As a product manager, I'm only good at telling people, yeah, we have, uh, we have five and a quarter inch drives, make them faster, make them bigger. I will never tell people, make me a three and a half inch drive because the customers don't tell me that they want three and a half inch drives. The engineer has to come to me and say, by the way, we have this new technology in the lab that says we can make three and a half inch drives. Did you know that? Oh, no, wonderful. Let's see what we can do there. So experimentation totally should be there, but it should be how much experimentation? Is it Google's 20% time? Is it uh, the 3M Corporation's 15% doodling time or whatever they call it? I don't know. It could be that you have an investment budget and I don't know, like Fairchild Corporation used to have that the, the senior executives had a certain number of millions literally in their back pocket to um, pursue random R&D things. Um, whichever it is, there has to be at least a certain amount and at most a certain amount. It shouldn't be unchecked. And typically when you're dealing with sales, it is unchecked. The, 
the approach from sales is ask, ask, and ask again until we get what we need. Uh, unfortunately, that behavior is rewarded, so you have to check it. But okay, uh, as you can tell, somebody from sales annoyed me this week. <laughs> we'll leave it there. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, at some point we'll pass the slides to Jabber for posting. And um, I don't know, how will you post the video? Can you, can you please po wait to post the video until after the Open Source Summit? Oh, sure, when is that? I think it's uh, beginning of July. Okay, can you email me a reminder uh, after that? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, all right, so let's see how the blue jeans experiment turns out. Mm -hmm. okay, so okay, you can put a note up on the website that uh, we're going to hold the video until after your presentation, the Open Source mm -hmm. Summit. Mm -hmm. Would that be okay, Jabber? Sure. I think there is somebody trying to speak, but I, I'm not hearing them. It's, uh, it's cutting in and out. Yes, there's one Oh, seems to be gone. Yeah, I guess we can call it a night now. All righty. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Rico. Sure thing. Good night. Thanks, Rico. Good night. Yeah, good night.